welcome back to my channel. I have our esteemed guest, back by popular demand, JB, and we are here at Fort Benning in the motor pool to show you something very, very special. This is the A3 variant of the Bradley, and we're going to talk a little bit about it and about the conversion that's going across the army with this vehicle right here. So, hi everybody, back again, JB. Sorry, it's me, couldn't find anybody better. Uh, I got my sister from another mister, uh, Sophie here, as you can see. We shop at the same stores. Uh, so we got the A3, we're going to talk about suspension, we're going to talk about some of the drivetrain components, we're going to talk about the inside, we're going to talk about what makes this uh, M3 slash M2 A3, you guys will see some of the differences, and uh, then we'll start playing with some of the buttons and stuff on the inside. Alright, so here we have the engine compartment. Technically, everybody calls it the engine compartment, but this isn't actually the engine. This is the transmission. So this transmission comes off of the engine, which is the Cummins 903T back there. Um, it connects to the transmission and then from the transmission it connects to the final drives through a prop shaft that if you have to tow this thing for any long distances you have to take it apart. Kind of a long drawn out process but that's about how it works. So all these little linkages and stuff this is how the driver talks to your uh, transmission. So we got our steering here, we've got our throttle here, the gear shifting and all that happens electronically nowadays. On the old Brad that you saw in the first video that we did that was all mechanical so everything you told it to do was because you grabbed a lever and you shoved a rod into place and then things started doing what they needed it to do so this is all electronic which is kind of nice um, here you got your generator that's what keeps all the electronics running and then back behind that you have your PTO or your power takeoff that's what uh, controls your fan back there that big fan it actually sucks the air from the radiator in the top cools off all the coolant that runs through this thing, about 22 gallons if anybody's wondering. Um, and that keeps all the engine and stuff cool. You know that goes bad when you have a giant cloud of white smoke jutting out through the top of your Bradley. So if that ever happens and your Bradley commander starts yelling a lot, that's because you screwed something up. Um, up here you got some uh, filters, then you got quick disconnects. It takes about 45 minutes for a good crew with a nice overhead uh, lift system like an 88 or a uh, overhead crane to get this all disconnected out on the ground and ready to do whatever they need to do to it. So that's this and uh, we'll get some shots of all the little stuff in here and kind of point out some things but that's pretty much it for the uh, engine compartment. So in our first Bradley video with JB, we went around and we showed you a lot of the externals. But since the externals haven't changed, basically at all, they've just added on armor and made it to where she doesn't float anymore, we're going to skip over a lot of that stuff. We'll talk about some of the drivetrain components, uh, and then we'll move on to the suspension, things like that. And then when we get to the specific parts that are different between this and uh, the A0 bread that we did before, then we'll point those out. Alright, so some of the differences that we were talking about between the A0 bread and the A3 bread. So we have extra armor. On the first video you saw, it was pretty much just the hole that you were seeing. Now they bolted on thick sheets of aluminum. Some places it's steel. It basically just makes it so heavy that it can't, um, can't float anymore. Um, up front we have a couple of extra tie down points because the vehicle is heavier than it used to be. On the uh, first generation of Bradley, it was only these inside sets. So they had to add extra tie down points to make sure these things don't fall off whatever you're trying to transport them with. Then we also have this big side plate on the side. It goes down the length of the vehicle and they took away some of the smooth features of the, uh, the early model brads and it's more angular now. Um, they've also made it a lot easier to climb up on. So over here on the side we have steps that climb up and uh, let you get up onto the brad a whole lot easier. Um, one of the other things that's a little bit different is the uh, driver's night sight is actually attached. So that little box up by the driver's uh, position it stays with the vehicle and you don't have to switch anything out. So some of you old school Bradley guys remember that you used to have to take out your center periscope, put in your night sight, and it was just a green night sight, didn't really do anything special, and it would get washed out by any source of light. So if you're driving towards the town, you wouldn't actually know where you're going. A little bit different now, it's thermal, so you can actually see heat and things like that, and you don't have to worry about switching out periscopes or anything like that. Um, other than that, she's pretty much the same, just a lot heavier than she used to be. Okay, so we're going to go through some of the suspension stuff. Uh, basically, we already talked about the engine compartment, how it goes from the engine to the transmission into the final drives. Then from the final drives, it goes to the sprocket. So your sprocket is a toothed wheel right here. Some people call it a drive sprocket. 
it's either one of two places on an armored vehicle. It's either in the front or it's in the back, like an Abrams has. So the Brad's a puller, it's in the front. Um, it's connected to single pin track. In this case, some of the other Brad's have double pin track. It's basically just, uh, it's almost like little small tank track. Um, underneath there, you got, underneath these side skirts, you've got your road wheels, same as before. Nothing really has changed. Um, it's supported track all the way back, so there's a single support roller in the middle. There's a couple of guide rollers um, in between there. And then uh, we'll get some shots underneath, and then we're going to move on to the back, and I'll tell you how track tension works. So, so get right here, and you're going to look right at this. Can you see it? Right here? Yeah. Alright, so this is one of your guide rollers. Alright, this is how you check your track tension. Track tension is done by pumping grease into a piston that is connected to the either wheel at the back of the track. It stretches out the track. So, by the book, you're supposed to be able to take a pencil and go in between the top of the track and this little support roller there. That's great and all if you're just rolling around a motor pool and all that but if you're going to be doing long operations things like that what you want to do is you want to tighten it up a little bit extra you're going to be able to take two fingers and you're going to be able to swipe it through there this one's a little loose for me now before you check your track tension one of the things you want to do is you want to make sure that the bradley rolls straight for a little bit and then you just ease to a stop that way you don't have any tension on one side or the other from turning um, once you do that you come back double check the space in between the top of your track and your uh, guide roller and then um, if you need to pump grease into it you pump grease right into this little piston here you pump it into the top it pushes this wheel back tightens up the track everybody's happy now if this has more than four inches of piston showing at the end it's maxed out you can't do anymore so you have to let all the grease out and you have to take one of these links out and you connect them back together and then re-pump grease it until your track tension's right. And that's no fun at all. And one of the last things I'll talk about on this side of the vehicle, well, okay, correction, two things I'm gonna talk about. Right here, combat identification panel. Basically, this just makes a big square on a thermal image of this vehicle. So you have hot Bradley, this will be different color. All right, so if you have white hot, this will be black. If you have black hot, this will be white. Basically, it just says this is a coalition vehicle. So that's an easy identification for anybody that has thermals. That's a good guy. Now, one of the things that we used to do to identify either which platoon or which track in which platoon in thermals, because you can't read bumper numbers. You can't read if you put tape up on the vehicle, like we have spray painting up on the bustle rack, things like that. You can't see that stuff in thermals. So what you do is you pick which one of the side skirts you want to flip. So let's say you're in first platoon, you flip this side skirt. If you're in second platoon, you'll flip this side skirt. That way, if you're scanning along, you're like, who is that over there? Oh, that's second platoon. I see all their side skirts on this is flipped up. That way you can tell. Because other than that, it's one Brad looks like another Brad in thermals. You can't really tell who's who. Um, now, really the last thing on this side, this little flap right here. I talked to one of you guys on the comments about hanging your, ba your bags on the outside. We still do that because the army says that the inside's for ammunition and things like that, not keeping our stuff nice. So what we do is we have this little flap here. This flap serves a couple of purposes. One, it is a thermal recognition site because this looks different in thermals. Also, we take our water cans and we shove them back behind here. What that does is that puts this out. All right, it comes out to about here, about the width of your rucksack. Then you come along and you strap all your rucksacks to the outside. This breaks any of the brush, branches, anything that you're about to run into that's not harder than rubber. It, uh, it breaks that and gets it out of the way so it doesn't rip your rucksacks or things like that or MRE boxes, your pallets of rippets that you have on the side of your vehicle, anything like that. It, uh, it makes a hole for it basically the size of the bread. But we can, you can also put anything back behind here. We normally stack up either two boxes MREs, two water cans will fit back there. You can go nuts. Whatever you can stick back there is fine. Um, other than that, really though, that's the end for this side. All right, so we're at the back. This is where the major differences between your M2 and your M3 Bradley normally are. 
Um, what's happened now though is the Army said we need to have six Brads in a, in a heavy platoon and 36 people. So the way we do that is we got rid of our tow racks. Um, on the right side, you, they used to have a space for 10 toes and it would be a nice rack, have a bunch of toes in there. When you didn't have toes in there, you just put all your bags in there. That way we kept them nice. Um, but we got rid of those. So now we have room for six people alone in the back of this thing. Um, we got bench seats down the side and in order to save money, the Army didn't just buy more M2 versions of the Bradley, which is meant to carry more people. They converted these M3s. The way you can tell one of the converted M3s is the firing ports in the ramp are gone. They were never there, so they never put them in because really we don't shoot out of firing ports any way anyway because that's just spray and pray and yeah, we don't, we don't get to do that a lot. Um, also, on top of the cargo hatch, there are the periscopes. So these periscopes here are on the hatch on a cavalry version and they're on the hull for an infantry version. So on the infantry version they're on the hull because they had the firing ports in the back and people need to be able to see out while they're spraying and praying with their firing port weapon. Um, up here on the cargo hatch this is just so people can look out. Now some of the cavalry units that I know have actually got issued actual M2s to be um, their vehicles so really I'm just telling you this for your vehicle ID so you can tell the difference between the two. Look for the uh, gun ports in the back, look where your periscopes are. Um, as for the back, like I said, we've got more bench seats than we do ammunition spots. When we get inside you'll get to see all the little stickers and stuff for where everything's supposed to be stowed. And It's, it's pretty simple, you still have your, um, if you guys watched any of the MRAP videos, we have little things on our uh, chairs so that our seats can take a blast. Well, our seats could take a blast in these because we keep our feet off of the um, the floor. And this floor is actually uh, designed to control impact as well. So if you have something blow up underneath you, that floor matting has a layer of Kevlar underneath it and it's strapped to the floor with almost like seatbelt material. So it comes up, but it doesn't come up so far that it hits you in the legs and makes you short. Um, but you're supposed to ride around with your feet up on these um, little foot bars, for a better term. Um, it's very uncomfortable if you have all your gear on for you to do that, but it's there if you want to. Um, also, some of your um, better sleeping arrangements are on the floor, and you also have down one bench. You have down the second bench. You can sleep a guy in the bottom of the turret. That guy's got to be a little flexible. Um, and then on the outside you could sleep quite a few people if they're not that bad with pointy things in their back. Um, other than that we'll talk about some of the specifics when we get inside and that's it for the back of this thing. Okay so we're in the back of the vehicle so this is where your squad boys hang out all right um, or as we used to call them our guys in back or Gibbs or Jaffos for any of you guys that know what that means. Um, so one of the things that sets us apart from the uh, the original A2s, the A0s, basically anything before an A3, this right here for the, the guys back here, it's the squad leader display. So this is not a touch screen, we aren't that fancy, um, but what this does is this allows the squad leader to brief his guys before he gets out. So normally you just kick some guys out and they're all confused and stuff. That's why they have battle drills for getting out of the back of a vehicle. They get out, they pull local security. That way their squad leader can either jump up on the side and talk to the Bradley commander or get with the, the squad leader that's gonna be on the ground in charge of everything and knows the plan and knows what's going on. Then they get their, their little quick brief of what the situation is and they go off and do dismount things. Um, this right here lets them do that before they get out of the protection of the armored vehicle. So what they could do here is this will have a map on it um, and if the vehicle is fully connected it'll have the map and a full update for where everybody is. Um, sometimes that doesn't work as good but they'll at least have a map and they'll know about where they're at. So they can all kind of sync up where they're at on the battlefield. Then they can actually take and look through the gunner's site and the commander's site and even the uh, driver's site to get a situational awareness for what it looks like on the outside. So if you want your squad of dismounts to get out and go hide in a bush. You can take the commander's independent site or the gunner's site 
aim directly at that bush. You can even laze it and tell how far away it is and be like, look, here's a bush at 250 meters off our left front, go there. And they can jump out of the back of the Brad, go around the corner, find that bush, match the pictures together and go hide in the bush. So it's broken down pretty much Barney style to where they don't get out of the back of the vehicle and not know what's going on. It's sometimes coming out of the back of a Brad without knowing what's going on is like coming out of a, of a Vegas casino or something at six in the morning, you're kind of the sun's up, you don't know what's happening. That's sort of the same thing. All right, so this kind of alleviates some of that fog of battle sort of situation. Um, uh, but yeah, so, and another added bonus to this, the driver has a display similar to this with all of his um, engine temperatures and ga basically his whole gauge cluster turned into this. And the commander has one of these where he controls uh, function of the turret and the map, things like that. He can actually make digital reports, things like that. If one of those two goes down, you can actually take this one off and go replace that one because this is the least important for the function of the vehicle and you can do that so your driver can still have his stuff and the commander can still have his stuff. It takes a little bit of time but it is an option if you need to. So that's the squad leader display and Sylvia here is modeling our combat vehicle crewman helmet. She can't hear a word I'm saying right now but that's fine. That's um, not true. I, I got it all. Okay. It's not that bad. Um, she's just smiling and laughing. Um, this actually, so we went a little bit more high tech than we used to be. These are made by Bose so spared no expense. They um, have an active um, active noise cancellation, so you can actually kind of cut down on the noise in here. For some of you old Brad guys, you know, this isn't exactly the quietest vehicle in the world. Um, also, they have a, um, a pass-through microphone. So if you have to get off the vehicle and you have a AA battery inside your helmet, you can actually get off the vehicle and flip a switch forward and you can hear what's around you. Kind of like um, shooting uh, earmuffs for a range, the electronic uh, range earmuffs. So you can actually, um, if you're ground guiding a vehicle or something, you don't have to put, take your CVC off, grab your helmet, jump off your vehicle, go do what you need to do. It just, it saves on a lot of time. Um, another thing it's, it's able to do is it's able to connect into the uh, VIC-3 communication system. So it can, talk on the radio, talk on the um, intercom with everybody. So these things are pretty nice. They got nice little ear cups in them and everything. Um, and yeah, so they're, they're pretty state of the art nowadays. Um, as you can see, this one has a, a mount on it so you can put um, a night vision device on. So if you're the Bradley commander, you can get up out and you can actually guide your vehicle at night without being that guy with like a red lens flashlight not knowing where you are or anything so it makes you a little bit more tactical um other than that the back isn't too interesting um the hellhole hasn't changed a whole lot they just stuck a lot more computers and stuff into it we'll get a shot down there towards the uh driver's hole and you'll get to see uh some of his station before we go all the way up there and get all up into that and then i think we're gonna go play in the turret all right let's go play in the turret Okay, here we are in the gunner station. So, if you notice, this looks a lot like the old bread. Not a whole lot's changed. It's mostly fire control, sights, things like that. As you can see, this is your turret drive system right here. This hasn't changed hardly at all. The, even the handles for putting it from manual to power mode, same thing. Um, but, big thing has changed is right here. This is your IBES, your Integrated Bradley Acquisition Subsystem. So this takes your, you used to have one single site that you'd look through. It looked kind of like this one right here. Um, this is your DVO or your direct view optic. So this is a straight telescope. You just look right through there, a little crosshair in there. That's for if your thermals go down. This is called your biocular display. Biocular meaning two eyes. So you use both eyes to look at this. You have your little brow piece right here so you can take your head and just stick it right here. You can look at all your symbology and stuff. That's where your thermals are. Um, this is your primary site right here. Um, then up here is your gunner's site control box. Um, this kind of replaced, uh, I talked about in the other video how you used to have to sit here with your hand up like this. For all you old school bread guys, you can still do that because your manual range knob is right here. So if you have to adjust your manual range, they kind of took that into account where your old school ways kind of work. So you put your arm over your head, you can adjust your range manually if you have to. 
This here has a laser in it though, so we don't normally have to do that. Um, your laser button is right here. You push it, laser goes out, comes back, tells you how far the target is. That automatically puts all of your ballistic information for the ammo type selected into your system. Um, if you're tracking a moving target, um, all you have to do is aim center mass, laze it, and then this will automatically input your lead and your elevation, and hopefully you'll get a first burst on target, and then you'll kill your target Dunskis. Um, really, there isn't a whole, whole lot to talk about over here besides that. We've got our high mag, low mag switches down here instead of up on the sight panel. Um, we have a button here to switch from your thermal to your TV site. TV site is basically just the what your DVO is seeing, but inside your biocular display. Again, your laser button right here, and over here you have uh, the ability to track a target. So you can actually put a box around a target and you can track it. Um, it takes more time than it's really used to, like it's, it's used for. You can actually kill a target before you get the box all the way around it. So. It's cool if you're just sitting around bored on a screen line or something, you're scanning for targets, you see a deer, you put a box around the target, you track it for a little bit. Other than that, it was designed if they were ever going to upgrade missile systems and you need to put a track box around something, you could do it with this. Um, but other than that, you can put a track box around the target and you can actually slew over. Um, so you have auto track, auto point. You can actually hit auto point and the turret will go back to that track box, but sometimes it drifts off of your target, things like that. It's it's not a very reliable system in my uh, opinion, um, and a lot of guys don't even bother with it because it takes more time than it's really necessary. So if you're bored, put track boxes all over the place. Um, if you got stuff to do, just kill the target, move to the next one. Uh, down here, we have our um, control box, our system control box. So in the old Brad, there used to be a box up here for your tow, and there was a box down here for your um, ammunition selection. Everything has been put on one box now. So that makes it easier for the gunner to control his gun or the commander could, to control the gun if the gunner's too busy doing whatever he's gotta do. All these stuff's clearly labeled. You have your arm safe and reset, so if we ever say electrically safe, you just make sure she's in the safe. Tow mode, that's if you want to shoot something with the tow missile tow up and down switch. So you move that to up, you squeeze your hand station, the tow goes up. Uh, once it's up, you just leave it in the up switch uh, or the up position and it'll stay up until you flip that switch down and make it go down. Missile one, missile two. So if you want to select one missile, you put the one missile. If you want to select the other missile because you've already shot one, you switch her over. Missile abort. So uh, let's say you're shooting at something, you realize, oh no, that's a friendly vehicle. You hit missile abort, it'll cut your wires and your tow will fall into the ground. Um, we have our turret power. That turns on all the turret power. Turret drive, that gives you electrical power to rotate the turret. Grenade launcher, so that controls the smoke grenade launchers out front. So, uh, 25 millimeter, 762 low ammo override. So uh, about this, some people, um, haven't figured out the, the nuances to gunnery. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little trick. This right here is a low ammo sensor. There are little laser sensors, and I don't know if you can see it down here, but there's a little blue box right at my feet. That is one of the laser sensors. So that laser hits a bunch of bicycle reflectors inside your ammo box. When that laser comes back to itself, it realizes that you're almost out of ammo. What that does is that will trip up your fire control system and cause a misfire. Um, and what that does is it's supposed to alert the crew that there is um, a problem with the gun or something like that. Um, in gunnery, that can cost you seconds for killing a target. So what you do is you take some tape and you wrap up that sensor so that you do not get a low ammo override on gunnery because if you blow time killing a target because you did low ammo, that's gonna, you're gonna be real upset that you didn't tape up your sensors. There's also one on the uh, coax ready box that we'll talk about once I get over to the other side, um, but you, you definitely don't wanna have a low ammo come on when you're doing gunnery. Combat and stuff, if you're not keeping track of your round counts and things like that, okay, I can see the use for it. Gunnery, you will fail engagements because you're not putting that many rounds inside your ready boxes. 
because um, you only get eight rounds per target for a 25 millimeter engagement. So definitely, if you're shooting gunnery, tape up your sensors. Pro tip. Um, right here, rate of fire. Single shot, 100 rounds a minute, 200 rounds a minute. Then right here, you select your AP or HE, depending. Um, we have two ready boxes. We have a big ready box and a little ready box. Big ready box holds uh, 230 rounds of ammunition. The little ready box holds 70 rounds of ammunition. Old school, it was an AP and HE ready box. However, now they're pretty much interchangeable. Um, how you'd normally set yourself up on a two Bradley section is one Brad will have 230 rounds of AP loaded and 70 rounds of HE loaded. That's your AP heavy Brad. The other Brad will set HE heavy, so 230 rounds of HE to handle all the trucks and things like that, and 70 rounds of AP in case a BMP shows up or something that he has to kill. That way, the two vehicles in a section can go through and say, okay, I've got all the PCs, you've got all the trucks, and you can separate your fire out like that. Then last button, your sear misfire button. If your low ammo override happens or your gun malfunctions, you hit this, it will unlock your gun out of misfire. You can rotate it back and you can clear your malfunction. Um, that's pretty much it for the, um, the gunner side. There's not a whole lot else going on here that's different from uh, the, the other videos that we've done. So um, I'll jump over in the other side and we'll go over that. All right, so we're on the commander side now. The commander side's had a lot of changes from the uh, A0 Brad that we did to the uh, A3 Brad. So I talked about it down in the squad leader area, but this is your commander's tactical display. So this is where he can monitor where the vehicle's at on the battlefield. He can talk digitally to other people. He can uh, pull up checklists and things that he needs for, um, like, let's say if we want to bore sight the gun and you don't want to pull out the manual, it's in here digitally. So you can go in and actually do that. You can adjust what reticle you have um, to fire with. So if you want the old school Brad reticle, you can actually pull that up in here and put it into your sight system. Um, here is the commander sight control panel. So the commander has his own independent um, sight, sort of like the, uh, the A2 um, Abrams has, a CITV, a commander's independent thermal viewer. This will be your commander's independent viewer, CIV. Um, it has thermal and it has TV. It doesn't have a laser. I don't know why they didn't give us a laser in it, but that's all right. What that does is that lets him scan for targets while the gunner is actually engaging targets. Um, and then if I find a target that's either more dangerous or if I find the next target he needs to hit, I can hit this button right here, this target designate button, and it will actually spin the turret over to what I'm looking at and he can engage it and destroy it. Um, this controls all of your thermal stuff, so your black hot, white hot, all that jazz right here. Um, down from there. So this is your data entry tool or your keyboard. It's just a keyboard. This is a little bit more weather resistant than your typical uh, keyboard, but if you have to type out a message digitally, you don't want to do it with the uh, thumb cursor that's up here because that takes forever. So you just type it out real quick and you're good to go. Um, he also shares the um, system control box with the gunner, so he can do anything he needs to do there. Um, the commander's hand station is a little bit more beefy than the old school Brad was. So the old school Brad was just a, uh, a hand station with your trigger, your Cadillacs, and a slew button. The slew button's gone. This is all rate of input now. So the more I turn this, the faster the turret goes. Um, we have our laser um, rangefinder button right here so I can laser a target if I am on the, um, the IBAS or the Bradley's main site. I can laser a target if I have to shoot something myself. Um, I have my tar target designate button right here. I have this little guard, so if I'm moving my little cursor around, which is right here, it's just a little thumb tracker cursor that I can move a, an actual mouse on here. If I'm doing that, I don't want to have to, if I have to click in, I don't want to have to pull my trigger to do it because that would be bad. Um, so there's a little guard right here, so you can kind of grab onto it. And then you have a high, high mag and low mag button on this side for you to switch between your high mag and low mag. Um, behind this door is still your coax chamber where the, uh, the gun is, so um, you just pull down on this and then this door will actually open up. Um, it, this screen does get in the way when you're trying to do that, so you have to be some sort of contortionist to make sure you get out of the way. Putting a full-size 
uh, M240 Charlie in there while this screen's in your way is a lot of fun. Um, it, it's almost like a yoga pose, it's pretty nice. Um, here we have our ammunition ready boxes. So we can hold 800 rounds of 762 coaxial machine gun ammo. Um, it is some sort of weird Jenga to get everything fitted into these boxes the right way. There is a picture on how to do it and how to link the boxes together. One of the first things I ever did when I was private, right after I had to manually turn the turret around, I think you guys remember that, is I had to figure out how to put 762 in these boxes. And I swear to God, it took me about an hour to figure out how to put all this stuff in there and get it right. It was, let's just call it fun. Um, also, if you'll notice right here, one of the things that we do is we put little reminders for us everywhere. And so this is one of the things that one of the crews has done. They're like, hey, what's our pre-fire checks to make sure that we're good to go? Right there. So for any of you that know Bradley stuff, that will look very familiar to you. Um, after you make sure all that stuff is good, you're ready to start shooting. Um, after that, we have, oh, we have our light. This is one of our gun lights. Um, there are several of these around. That's because it's normally dark in here when we're shooting stuff. So we can take this out. We can put it where we need to put it to uh, get light. There's several different mounting points for this. But uh, one of them's up here so the commander can look at his coax and things like that if he's got a clear malfunction and something like that. Um, the radios are behind me. Um, this right here, this very important handle, is the OSH or the oh shit handle. So your driver's being bad you're just holding on for dear life this is it right here okay if you need to pull yourself up you can do that um you can rotate it down if this is the best way to hold on for dear life um so that's it right here uh, also you will catch this right in the face if you're not careful so it uh it behooves you to hold on to that bad boy mm, other than that for this side not a whole lot else going on. We have our commander sight right here. Um, this is the remote biocular display. It's just a, another version of what the uh, gunner's seeing. This little switch right here is how he switches in between it looking through the commander sight, looking through the gunner sight. So if I want to take over the gun, I switch up and then I take over the gun. If I want to look through my own sight, I switch down, I'm looking through my own sight. Um, oh, one thing. Four. All of you brad guys that are currently in so a couple things if you've ever heard of bitching betty every military organization has one on their vehicles it's where the computer system tells you you're doing something wrong there's there this is your communications control box right right here where it says alarms you notice there's nothing plugged in all right there's a little plug that normally straight out of the factory it comes with that it says alarms all right you unplug that bitch and betty's gone so if you're doing something stupid that you know you're doing stupid the the computer is not going to tell you about it now for all you guys that don't know uh if you want to hear your ipod shuffle through your headset this is how you do it you take an old set of headphones that you don't want anymore right wired up headphones you can't use your cool beats ones for this use your wired up headphones right take the earbud part cut it off you're going to take those wires off of the earbuds you strip them down to copper right roll them up a couple times so you got a fat wad of copper then you take these little uh these little turn knobs here and you rotate them all the way and all those are little pinch knobs to stick wire into you see where i'm going with this you take the ball of copper you shove it in each one you put one on one side one on the other then you take that 3.5 millimeter headphone jack sticking in your little ipod shuffle boom you've got your own internal stereo going on that only you're the dj for so everybody in the crew has to deal with you and nobody on the radios can hear what you're doing so that's your uh that's your way to party out all right everybody does it just do it it's great if you're bored sitting on a screen line or something have karaoke night in the bradley it's fine just don't don't sing so loud that you give away your position close your hatchets or something it'll be fine um you have a turret fan back here that will eat things if you stick it in there. That's to keep all the computers and stuff cool. It's louder than hell. Um, other than that, that's it. That's the turret. Uh, a lot more electronics in here than the old one, but the structure is all pretty much the same. Do you have a commander story? Hmm. Do I have a 
don't really have a commander story off the top of my head. Mm. If I think of one, though, we'll come back to it. Do you have a driver story? I have a gunner story. So I was a gunner in Iraq. We're driving along, and I'm scanning diligently for bad guys on top of an overpass. Our um, track falls off, right? Because we were driving up and down pavement, and that's not good for the heat in Iraq and all that jazz. So track flies off. Um, as I talked about in the uh, drivetrain thing, if your track is not touching the sprocket, you no longer have control of that side. So the vehicle starts spinning out of control, a pirouette, if you will, and it is spinning. The rest of the crew freaking out, obviously. Me, I don't know we're doing it because the turret is fast enough to keep up with the vehicle spinning. We did three full rotations before we came into a stop. I'm still scanning the top of that thing, wondering, one, why my little turret position indicator box was freaking out in the bottom of my uh, sight, and two, what everybody was yelling about, because I didn't see anything wrong on the top of that overpass. So then we actually come to a stop, we hit the little curb uh, on the side, and we kind of bounce up a little bit, and I feel the jolt, and I'm like, what was that? The, my Bradley commander at the time was like, you didn't, you didn't know that we were spinning out of control right there? And I was like, I had no clue. I jump up out of the top and I look back about 100 meters behind us is our track laying out on the road with a bunch of skid marks from all of our road wheels wearing themselves flat on the uh, on the pavement. So this turret's fast and the, the stabilization's real good. I probably could have engaged a target on top of that and actually hit it. But uh, yeah, we, we pirouetted to success. So that's, uh, that's my gunner story. Okay, so a little quick snippet on the uh, on the 25. So this is your M242 Bushmaster. The gun hasn't changed a whole lot. They've upgraded the motor a little bit, um, but everything else is pretty much the same. The Navy gets to shoot these on little shoulder hoop mounts, which that's awesome. Like I want to do that, but I'm probably never going to get to. But this thing rocks the whole bread when you're shooting. Like you can feel it anywhere you're, that you're shooting. Um, so your rounds feed in from the left. They go. There's two different feeds like I talked about before you have a big box little box so they go in here this thing right here this is your feed select solenoid that's going to tell you whether you're pulling HE or AP depending on which box it's coming from um, the gun's gonna cycle all right it has a 1.1 horsepower motor that is electrically driven so if it can the gun is going to cycle um, so you got to kind of watch out between um, between like if you have a malfunction on the gun something like that or if one of your link shoots comes off you're gonna have to watch out for how much effort you give this gun to destroy itself so if something goes wrong that gun motor is going to make it go horribly wrong so if you feel something that doesn't feel right while you're shooting stop double check everything things like that a lot of people say it's a finicky weapon system and it is but once you find out the way that it works for you do it every single time so if you find the right way to put your feeder back on, do it that way every time. And if anything goes wrong with your gun, take everything apart, start back at zero, do it back the way that you know it works, and your gun will work for you every time.